Dami Kang. Uh, uh, first for CEO, you, you. Okay, <laughs> oh, yeah, please, Alan, uh, start at first. So, uh, so you will speak uh, uh, thoracic, uh, thoracoscopic surgery uh, for the very uh, complex pulmonary rejection. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your kind introduction. Well, um, as you know, uh, the, the session's been changed around a little bit. Originally, this was meant to be a debate uh, between uh, robotic surgery and uh, VAT surgery, and I was going to speak for VAT. So what you'll see really uh, in this talk, a lot of my slides are going to be about uh, pro-VATs. I don't want to be too anti-robot, but um, because of the change in schedule, I've, I've just modified the talk a little bit, and uh, really we're going to talk about the future of uh, minimally invasive surgery in thoracics. Um, a bit of robots, a lot of that, and uh, we'll see how we get along. Now, the reason I think the future of MIS uh, is quite an important topic to talk about is because of this. Because we are facing, as uh, thoracic surgeons, as lung cancer surgeons in particular, a lot of uh, challenges on the horizon. And as you all know, there are things like SBRT, which has been around for a number of years, but in more recent years, we've seen the uh, advent of immunotherapy and even proton beam therapy coming, uh, coming online uh, all around the world. And all of these options, as you look at them, they're very, very attractive to patients, much more attractive than surgery can be because no cut, very effective cure, very high uh, control rates, uh, uh, progression-free survival is uh, very, very good, very attractive. It's so advanced, in fact, that things like immunotherapy have prompted comments like this. This is an actual quote from a famous American surgeon. And after looking at the Pacific trial and looking at how effective it was for stage 3A lung cancer, he actually says surgery is not going to be part of the treatment anymore. He's actually surrendered treatment of stage 3A lung cancer completely to immunotherapy. Now, wow, that's pretty alarmist. And it's not necessarily true to follow this kind of line of thinking because I think surgery still has a lot to offer. But the key is we need to make surgery accessible and palatable for a lot of our patients. It has, we have to make it more attractive. And there are various ways of doing this. And then we see over the years that as we move from open surgery to vasectomy to being the standard today, we've now evolving our surgery, of course, to make it even better. And one of the ways, of course, is robotic surgery. Now, I've trained in robotic surgery in the past, and I still think, as I was saying yesterday, I still think it's very, very useful, very effective in many ways. But nonetheless, I think a lot of us, including myself here in Asia, we've gone down a different path. We've gone down what we call uh, next generational VATs, where we're doing needoscopic, two ports, and especially uniportal VATs today. Now, as you make a decision you know, between uh, which way to go, there are many considerations uh, to take in mind. Now, what has the world in general actually chosen? Have they gone down the robotic route or have they gone down the VATS, uh, advanced VATS route? Now, if we look at the American data, you will see here the red line is open surgery. It's coming down, and that's good news for patients. The blue line is VATS in America. It's increased a little bit, more or less stable, over the last 10 years for various reasons particular to the United States. In America, though, you can see the green line. Actually, this is the line that uh, Intuitive always likes to play up, is that the rate of use of uh, robotics for uh, lobectomy in recent years in America is actually steadily increasing. But despite the increase, it's still some way off VATS in America. Now, that's the American situation. But if we leave America, you find that the rest of the world isn't really following that trend in a big way. Of course, there are many uh, great uh, robotic surgeons all around the world, but outside the United States, it's still a novelty, it's still a rarity. For example, in the UK, not that different culturally and uh, economically from America, but in the UK, look at where robotic surgery is. Less than 1% of all their major lung resections, their lobectomies, are done by robotics. Of course, uh, Dr. Khan isn't going to change that, but still, it's a very minor rarity. If we look across Europe in general, this is a European questionnaire done by the ESTS. In this questionnaire asking people about how they do different types of thoracic surgery, robotics isn't even on the survey. It doesn't even register. What's interesting, though, of course, is VATS. Now, you have the blue block, which is the traditional multi-port VATS, but pay attention to this. 
the yellow block. That's uniportal vats. And over the last few years, thanks to people like Diego, the use, the uptake of uniportal vats is actually becoming very significant. The rate of uptake of next generational vats is far outstripping robotic uh, surgery for major lung resection. And of course, here in Asia, and if we take here uh, the Chinese example, again, it's not surprising that the vast majority of our major lung resections are done by vats. But again, pay attention to this line. This is the uniportal vats uptake rate. And for major lung resections, it's already quite an astounding figure. Uh, amongst the associate chief surgeons, for example, about a quarter, over a quarter of all the major lung resections are now done by uniportal vats today. So the question is, why is uniportal vats rising so quickly? And why is robotics really a bit slow on the uptake? And there are various reasons behind that. It could be a little bit counterintuitive, in fact, because if you listen to our robotic colleagues, they always tell you that robotics is easier to learn. It has a shorter learning curve, and therefore everybody should be learning it. And yeah, I, I agree that uh, robotics is not difficult. But if you actually look at the figures they use to say that robotics has a short learning curve, early papers like these, you find that, yeah, it seems to be comparing favorably to standard vasovectomy. But don't be misled. A lot of these individual studies, if you look at them, with robotic surgery, these early uh, adopters, they actually had VATS experience. They already had experience with the use of minimally invasive approaches. And really, from their point of view, the learning curve is from a VATS lobectomy background onto robotics. Whereas the early the papers they quote here for VATS lobectomy, that was straight from open surgery to VATS lobectomy. What we really should be comparing is starting on a background of VATS lobectomy, three-port VATS lobectomy, whether you move on to robotics and whether you move on to uniportal surgery, what's the difference in the learning curve there? And if you look at that, actually you find that the learning curve for uniportal VATS is not as difficult as you would think. It's actually very simple. Now you see here on the left, okay, this is needloscopic surgery. Essentially it's three-port surgery. But as you move from needloscopic to two-port surgery, the only difference is a change in instrumentation because essentially your camera is exactly in the same place. You just move your hands to share the same port. A very easy step any of you can do tomorrow. And when you master that, you just move from two ports to single port, and that's just a matter of moving your camera into the same basic port. You've already grasped that shared port instrumentation. So it's actually a very easy two-step procedure to learn uniportal VATS. And that's what people are finding. It's not that difficult once you get past the initial sort of a mental barrier. And uh, in fact, we've proven it. In Shanghai, Diego and I, we run this course for uh, uniportal VATS. We've done it now for a good number of years. Uh, uh, seven or eight times a year, we invite 20 odd uh, surgeons from around the world. They have a little bit of background in vaxlobectomy. They come to Shanghai, and all we do is just two weeks of observation. They don't even need to scrub in. They just watch our surgeons operate day in, day out for two weeks. And the results are spectacular. With just two weeks of doing nothing but just watching fellow VAT surgeons do uniportal surgery, the improvement in their skills before and after attending the course is quite staggering, and we've published this. So it, this just goes to show that uniportal VATS is something that's very teachable and very learnable. So I think that's one of the reasons why the uptake of uniportal VATS is actually increasing very rapidly. Now, if we were gonna find another reason why uniportal VATS is outstripping robotics around the world, obviously we have to talk about cost. Now, this is a very early paper uh, from Bernie Park and Roger Flores, and you can see both VATS and RATS compares very favorably to thoracotomy. Now you expect early in the rob robotic experience that uh, the costs will be a bit high, but even after some time, you'll find that some of the costs won't go away because robotics, intuitive with their monopoly, they will charge you a lot of money for their consumables. And you can see that the disposable costs, just the consumables themselves, will cost you an extra $1,200 in many cases. Now it's not that that's not the only cost, because consumables is only one part of the equation. When you perform robotic surgery, the other part is 
the initial capital cost. You have to buy the machine in the first place. And for many of us here in Asia, that's already a, a hurdle that can be overcome. But after that, it's still not finished. You have annual maintenance costs, which are quite expensive. You have the cost of depreciation, because unlike your simple Scanlon instruments, these things will become obsolete over time. And as soon as you buy a robot and it sits in your hospital, every day it's depreciating, and that's a cost. And don't forget, you also have to train not only yourselves, but your assistants, your entire team, and that also incurs costs. And when you put it all together, robotics for many parts of Asia is not really an affordable option. Now, look at what it costs to do uniportal VATS. It costs this. That's all you need. You all are doing VATS already. And if you want to do uniportal VATS, you can get started straight away. If you want to do uniportal VATS a little bit better, that's all you need to invest in. This is exactly the kit I use in Hong Kong and in Shanghai right now. Look at that. How expensive can that be? And you can reuse these instruments on hundreds of patients before you finally break your instruments. That's how cheap it is. And not only that, there are so many ways to save money with uniportal vats. You all know this. You can tie instead of staple. I use vascular clips on a lot of my lobectomies now. And a simple lobectomy with a good fissure, I usually do it with just two staple fires. Now, yes, you can do this with the robotics, but you've already incurred the extra cost. But doing uniportal vats, cheap. So many cheap options. And that's another reason why, especially in places like China, we're doing uniport vats. Quite standard nowadays. Very easy, very cheap. Now, the big thing, though, is not just cost, because bringing down costs alone is not the key issue. The key issue is what Robert Sfolio calls value. Now, if you don't know what value is, very simple. It's actually the improvement in quality and service over the investment in terms of costs. So yeah, less cost, better value. But if you pay a lot of cost and you get a lot of improvement in your quality, maybe it's worth it. So I think now we need to look at what quality is being provided by robotics and by uniportal vats. Now, if you look at all the papers of robotics, and I just choose a few here just at random, you will find that if you compare robotics to open uh, surgery, Yes, definitely. See all those fantastic p values here. Robotics is definitely uh, better uh, quality than open lobectomy. But when you compare it to VATS lobectomy, a lot of those differences tend to fade away. And even if you do get significant differences, the absolute improvement in uh, uh, quality over VATS is not that big. And it's proven in paper over paper. For example, here's another meta-analysis looking at morbidity between rats versus vats. In return for all the extra costs of doing rats, how much improvement in morbidity are you getting? Next to nothing, nothing. And that's the key issue here. Here's another paper using the STS database a few years ago from America. And again, you're finding that uh, when you compare rats and vats, yeah, um, you, you, they do find that you pay more money, you, you spend more time doing the operation, but they highlight, yes, by doing uh, rats, you get shorter hospital stays. But is it? Read the fine print. Yes, the p-value is less than 0 0.001, but that's the proportion of patients who stay for four days or less, and you're only improving it by 10%. Now, is that little bit small figure, is it really worth you spending millions of dollars buying a new robot system? Maybe if it works if you're working in New York, but if you're working here in Chiang Mai, maybe that's a slightly different consideration. Now, let's turn to uniportal vats. Does uniportal vats, is it worth changing from multiport to uniport? Now, if you asked me back in 2016, I said probably not because the evidence back then was quite thin. Now, I've updated this table because Mark Ferguson asked me this year to write a new book chapter, so I redid the uh, systematic review. And this is what the systematic review looks like as of end of 2019. So we look, look at all these different papers, and all the blocks in blue are now where the studies find that uniportal vats gives you an advantage over traditional multiport vats and the evidence is now building. It's still not completely conclusive, 
But if you look down the column, for example, pain, that pain column over there, over half the studies now actually conclude significantly that the unipolar vats gives you less pain. So the evidence, the clinical evidence, is now actually gradually building in favor of unipolar vats. And really today, this is something you should be considering if the cost is not great. Now, don't just take my word for it. This is a study done by my good friend Calvin Ng and his colleagues over at Ismix. And they actually did a very nice uh, meta-analysis, uh, uniportal vats and robotics versus multiport vats. So this is quite, quite a nice one. Uh, oh yes, I think Dr. Khan was also on the panel, yes. So what they concluded was that generally across the board, when you compare robotics and, and uh, uniportal versus multiport vats, not much difference. There were only two categories where they did find difference. First was uniportal vats, yes, it did reduce pain compared to multiportal vats. Now, did robotics offer this? Unfortunately not. The other thing that we found was that robotics was associated with higher costs. And these are the only two key differences they found on meta-analysis. So this just hammers home the point. In terms of actual value, next generation vats is still outperforming robotics, unfortunately for our robotic colleagues. <laughs> okay. But that's not the end of the story, of course. There are many new developments along the way, and uh, you've already seen yesterday that there are many new RATS platforms coming out. This is just one of them. More ergonomic, easier to use. Look at that. That's much more comfortable than looking down at binoculars when you operate. Perfect. There are even systems here. This was developed in the UK. This is already being tested uh, clinically uh, by my friend uh, Joel Dunning. These, this system that might not look like much, but you have these individual uh, robotic arms you can dock in different directions. But more importantly, the company making this says it offers no extra costs compared to conventional VATS lobectomy. And if you're not paying no extra costs and you can achieve this and you can stand and operate comfortably, wow, very attractive indeed. And we're not even yet talking about this. And you've seen these videos already, Uniportal, uh, robotic surgery, and you've seen uh, all these demonstrations. I've seen videos that actually use this on cadavers, so they've gone on to cadaver stage, and it's feasible to use this for lobectomies. They haven't tried it on a real patient yet, but it's not that far away. But having said that, you know, it's still not perfect. You still have to work out how you're going to retract along. There's still a bit difficulty. These limbs are still a little bit too, too uh, flimsy for uh, actual lung manipulation. But we're getting there. So robotics, yeah, it does have a very nice future. But that's neglecting the fact that VATS itself, advanced VATS, is not standing still. Even with advanced VATS, we're moving uh, forwards. There are some people doing sub xiphoid surgery. Well, better, better or not, I don't know. But it's available, it's out there. Uh, Martin Zielinski in Poland, he's doing it transcervical through a collar incision. You can do a lobectomy completely avoiding intercostal pain. Wow, interesting. Again, I'm not too sure whether this will work or not, but work is being done. And if you want to play around with technology, there is technology available for advance nowadays. We now have you know, various 3D systems. So a lot of the advantage that people say we have with the robotics is the better view you get, the 3D view. Well, you don't need a robot just to give you a 3D view. And if you want the wristed instruments, there's quite a few systems available right now, today, for purchase that will give you that flexibility, even with VATS, with much lower cost. And it's out there. You can buy these things. So where is the advantage of robot? Well, again, I think we're shortening that gap. But the most important message, I think, today is forget everything I just said. Forget VATS. Forget VATS. This is the curve that you need to know about value. Because value, as you increase your investment, you get better patient outcomes. You're expecting that. And in the early days when we moved from open surgery to conventional VATS, that curve was very steep. Just a little bit of investment going to multiportal VATS, you're getting a great leap in patient outcomes. But we've reached the stage today when all of your patients, my patients, they're going home in just a couple of days. They have virtually next to no pain. And you're throwing a lot more money at technology, whether it's with VATS, whether it's with RATS. Are you actually expecting that much more improvement in quality than what you've already got? 
yes, you probably will get a bit of outcome. But when your patient already goes home in two days, what, more out, what better outcome can you expect? What difference does it make to the patient that he can go home 12 hours earlier? That actual benefit for that amount of investment is reducing. It's a diminishing return. And the problem with our over-focus on techniques, on approaches, on technology, is that we're ignoring some of the more important issues in lung cancer resection. Issues such as ERAS. We're focusing so much on just this direct link between surgery and outcomes that we're forgetting that there's much more to surgery than that. Perioperative management, anesthetic management, postoperative rehabilitation, these all make a difference. And just to emphasize that, I always love showing this video from my good friend here, John Carlos Desnef Pereira, who works in uh, Paris. This is his extreme fast track rehabilitation. And if you're looking at this, this is his patient after a thoracotomy in the operating room corridor, immediately after surgery. And this crazy sadist is marching this patient up and down the corridors immediately after surgery. He gets all his patients eating within an hour, mobilizing within an hour, and this is with a thoracotomy. And this just shows that if you have good perioperative management, it doesn't matter if you're doing uniportal VATS. It doesn't matter if you're doing robotics. That's not the key issue. If you care for your patient holistically, you know, as a whole person, you can achieve fantastic results without massive investment in technology and fancy uh, gadgets and instruments. This is just one issue. Another issue that we're always neglecting is this. No matter how much money you put into your robotic system or into uniportal VATS, you're not gonna cure any more patients. You're still taking the same lobe out. The only way we can bring down mortality rates for cancer overall is this, lung cancer screening. We have the data for it. And yet, because we're so heavily invested into robotics and new technology and new instruments, we're forgetting this. So we're here at the ASCVTS conference. And have you heard about screening yet? Have we, have we had, I don't think we have lung cancer screening on the program yet. That's something we need to fix because this is how we as surgeons are gonna cure more patients. And we're also, we also have to be aware that our oncology friends are not waiting for us to fight this battle between rats and bats. They're moving on, as we said, with proton beam therapy, with immunotherapy. They're not gonna wait for us. We need to figure out how in the new era of target therapy, of immunotherapy, how we're gonna integrate our surgery with this new oncological treatment. And immunotherapy, yeah, there have already been a few studies looking at the use of uh, surgery in conjunction with immunotherapy. There's even been a Cochrane review, but you can see here, only a few studies, nothing yet shown. But moving forwards, we should be focusing on multidisciplinary care for all our cancer patients. That's the way forward, not new minimally invasive platforms per se. So I just wanna conclude this long-winded talk and so the original conclusion when we still doing debates was if you compare rats to uniportal vats, yes, uh, I think robotics is fading a little bit in the comparison. And that's probably because uniportal vats is gaining popularity more quickly. It's, I think it's actually very easy to learn and not, not, much, not much more difficult than learning the robot. It's more economical, way more economical and cost effective. And today, as we're speaking now in, Gen in February uh, 2020, I think it's still supported by better evidence than robotic surgery. But that's not the key. I think the key is, do these platforms represent value? Are they actually adding anything to your service for the investment put in? Yes, maybe. But I think really, if you want value, we should be looking in different directions, at ERAS, at screening, at multidisciplinary care. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan. So, uh, do you have any questions or comments? So, uh, may, may, oh, okay, please. Um, great talk. Thanks very much, Steve, for answering this question. I was just wondering, uh, I hear in Shanghai, you know, there's hospitals probably like your own doing yeah. 4,000. No, that 4,000 was what we were doing in 2012. What are you doing Shanghai now? Shanghai Pomeroy Hospital, where I'm a guest professor of Diego, uh, in 2018, we did 18,000. 
So we did 18,000 yep. operations, and obviously very gifted surgeons with us. How is it possible that the only trial comparing in a prospective randomised manner, uniportal versus multiportal, is a small trial by Perna? Yes, and, just and it was a very flawed trial. Month. Yeah, sure. Well, why don't you t just next month do a thousand each way, answer the question. Yeah. Thank you very much. Advance things scientifically rather than a page full of retrospective level four evidence yeah. for us. Very good question. No, fantastic talk. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you. Very good question. And uh, if, if you want an answer, it will probably take me about three hours. But uh, to cut a long story short, though, uh, Diego and I, we've actually tried doing that so-called randomized trial since 2013. And if you actually come in, you're very welcome, please come and visit us in Shanghai. You will see that every, to achieve 18,000 cases a year, the entire surgical department is operating eight till eight, Monday to Friday. And they have zero time for any academic work. Trust me, we've tried very, very hard to push the uh, study through, but even establishing a prospective database for us has been quite a challenge. So at the moment, the, the figures, unfortunately, are limited. I think we have published uh, several uh, big uh, case series. But uh, the randomized trial, wow, that will, I think, will, will require a bit more effort, I think, in the coming few years. But absolutely good point. Having said that, though, uh, there ha is a new initiative through the ESTS and in the Japanese uh, uh, group. Uh, we're setting up two Uniportal VATS interest groups. So these are academic surgeons doing uh, uh, Uniportal VATS. And hopefully, we can probably arrange some multi-center trials in the coming few years. So stay, stay tuned. We'll have some more news for you soon, hopefully. May I have one question? <laughs> so, yeah, <sorry>. so, so, <laughs> you, so you showed us uh, uh, so the infotal bus is very uh, so, uh, uh, good quality uh, for the patient. So uh, I'd like to think uh, from the surgeon's perspective. So. Uh, so I saw uh, once uh, uh, the very unique uh, clinical study. Uh, so the uh, so during the open surgery and the thoracoscopic surgery, the heart rate of surgeons were ex uh, so examined, oh, yes. and so, so it is uh, so significantly the heart rate is higher, uh, significantly higher in the VATS. So uh, so the, I, I think that the, uh, which is more comfortable for surgeons, the VATS. Uh, rats or uh, you put the rats. <laughs> yes, that, that's so true. I, I totally agree with you, and I, I don't really have an answer to that. Um, all, all I can say about that is is that uh, it's it's also, of course, assistant dependent. I think your heart rate goes up when you have a bad assistant. But uh, it's an important point because we're always measuring uh, surgical outcomes, the usual things, operation times, blood loss, length of stay, et cetera, et cetera. But I think we're neglecting a lot of other uh, outcome measures which are also very relevant. One of them, is, as you say, is the surgeon experience. I think nobody's actually looked at that. And if anybody here in the audience is interested in some research, that's one way to go. We've heard, I think yesterday, if one of our colleagues was mentioning, you could actually measure uh, the facial blood flow or the movements of your eyebrows up and down. And this is one way to do it. Another thing that we're often neglecting, uh, especially in VATS and VATS uh, uh, outcomes, is patient reported outcomes. And I'm not talking about pain scores, but there are a lot of uh, patient experiences that we're not really taking, uh, taking into account of. So I think as we move forwards, if we're doing these studies, as, as you mentioned, these randomized trials, I think we need to evolve our patient outcome measures to take that into account better. And I think if that is taken into account, robots might actually fare a lot better than what I've just shown. Thank you. Much. No, no, please. Oh, a couple of comments. Oh, OK, please. Oh, uh, yeah, my name is Olin from New Zealand. Alan, this is about the fourth or fifth time I had you talk in international <laughs> meeting. And more than your presentation is your enthusiasm that <laughs> comes through each time. So it's very ambitious. Um, a few points I want to make an observation. I mean, one thing you didn't put on about the explosion of Unibot of that is yes. Diego himself, because Yes. He should be in Guinness Book of Record. I mean, he's a guy who has oh, operated yes. in more than 200 different operating theaters. Yeah, uh, 105 50, countries. Yeah, more, more than 50 yeah. just in China. And he's a guy who got no limit to what he can do. Yes. But Diego himself made the observation that all he did was technique. Yes. So I think for the thoracic surgical society, your point is very important that everybody's got to be aware that whether you can do the operation within five minutes or with the McDonald's, you just drive in and drive out, 
it does not improve the understanding of the disease yes. or the better management of the particular problem. So we have in the last 10 odd years, the emphasis is totally wrong, if you like. Mm. If you're talking about the pain, who matters if the patient is going to die within the next two years, whether the patient has pain or not, really, if you can make the two years to 10 years, that's what matters. So I think we have lost the forest for the, the trees, that's one point. Another one is the caution about your enthusiasm of the screening. So we learned from the breast that when you do the breast of the breast being very well done, in Sweden, you, a woman can go up in the clinic within two hours mm. if you have all treated. But the mortality from the breast cancer has not changed. That did not change it. Japanese are the very good example. Japan, they got a lot of lung cancer early stage. And I would argue that it would be hard push to say that Japanese people are little living longer because of this problem. Because what the screening does is you increase the rate of diagnosis, but not the staging. The stage who are going to be in stage three, stage four, they always are exactly the same. You do not stop them. So what it does do is the lag time and the lead time has different. So a lot of the things that you end up taking out the segmentectomy or lobectomy, other people perhaps you are not making them live longer because of that. Mm. So I think there's a lot of issue with all the screening programs, not just, just not the breast, prostate, all the screening programs have that. So I think if we are really going to be serious about going with the lung screening, I think there got to be caution about how much we should do for all these kids because a lot of them you'll be operating for nothing. Thank you. That's a very, very important point. And it's, it's actually a topic of another talk I have about what to do with these uh, screening detected nodules. And in fact, uh, this afternoon here in ASCVTS, uh, we're going to be holding some preliminary meetings about how we move forward with new guidelines on the management of these screening detected nodules. And hopefully everybody here in the ASCVTS uh, will be opening uh, that discussion up, hopefully, to everybody, and we need to get involved. Now, just to cut a very long story short, these screening detected nodules, uh, they're actually not all benign. Uh, one of the key findings of the uh, Nelson trial is exactly what you're saying, is that actually, no, it's actually in, uh, increasing the proportion of patients that are being detected in stage 1A, whereas traditionally in, in the Nelson trial, uh, with traditional uh, methods, most of them, as you expect, stage 3, stage 4, but after the implementation of low-dose CT screening in the Nelson trial, over 50% of all their patients were detected in stage 1A or 1B. So that's a huge shift. And that's why they're uh, getting a lot of the, the... Now, the other issue we were mentioning is overdiagnosis. Now, that's something that I think uh, a lot of... Uh, just last week in S uh, SDS, we were talking with American surgeons. I think in the Western world, in different populations, they do have this problem of overdiagnosis with screening. But I think a lot of our experience here in Asia is that if you actually have these nodules, it goes to an MDT and you actually proceed to surgery, we're finding that a lot of them are actually malignant, or at the very least pre-malignant. And it makes a difference. Now, the one school of thought is you can either just wash these lesions, treat them conservatively with follow-up screening, and if it changes, in future you do a lobectomy. Or you can intervene early at this stage and do a wide wedge or segmentectomy. If you do a wide wedge or segmentectomy for a stage 1A tumor, very often you're getting 80, 90% five-year survival. If you do a lobectomy three years down the road when the tumors progress to a T2, then your survival suddenly becomes less than 80%. So this is an issue I think that we really need to look into. And as I said, here in ASCBTS, I think this is one of the things that we need to be discussing, I think, with the broader membership as well. As well. I think there are many issues involved there, but that's an excellent, excellent point. Thank you. Can I make a comment, please? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks, Alan. Really enjoyed your talk. Thank and, you. Uh, it's, it's a shame I'm not uh, rebutting you on this. <laughs> I would have loved to, but they told me to do another talk, so we stopped there. Okay. But uh, coming up with June's point about a surgeon's comfort and how good, how comfortable you are with doing what type of surgery, uh, we actually at my hospital uh, had a look at this. Uh, we did uh, echocardiography and cardiac workup mm. of me before, because I do robotics, VATS, uh, you know, the whole gamut. So we did an echocardiographic workout of me 
before I did uh, robotic surgery and after I did the face. And then we did an echocardiographic workup of me when I was trying to do some other complex works. And, and the bottom line is I was really surprised to see the actual results. Uh, with a robotic, you're actually much more comfortable. You're sitting there casually, and when you get stressed, you can walk out of the theater and you know have a cup of coffee and come back in. So actually, my own cardiac findings, my own heart rate readings, and you know we had a whole term monitoring and all that going on. And actually, my own findings were much, much better when I was not scrubbed, sitting on a console, doing robotic surgery. So there is uh, a lot of evidence to say. And that's one of the reasons why I personally don't jump into the uniportal bandwagon in a big way, because mm -hmm. I don't want to be stressed. I've got only one life. <laughs> I want to live it comfortably. And yes, the patient may do better or may not do better, because the evidence still is not very clear. But I need to live to be able to see the outcome of my surgery. Mm. So I don't want an angina. I don't want coronary artery disease. So I think it's important that we also look at surgeon parameters when we try to ana analyze one technique versus the other. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you. So the next speaker is uh, Professor Zamir Khan. Uh, he will speak for uh, robotic surgery for lung cancer. You changed. <laughs> uh, is, hello. Yeah. What's happened is because Alan was going to cover robotics and VATS for lobectomy, so I was asked to talk about thymectomy, uh, talk about uh, uniport, uh, talk about uh, robotic thymectomy. So we will try and discuss a little bit about that. Can you have my slides, please? Now you should have the signal. Go ahead. You've got the signal, yeah. Yeah, yeah, it's okay. Go ahead. Okay. So have you got that? All right. So I've been to asked to talk uh, about robotic thymectomy and try and give a perspective on robotic thymectomy and whether we should do open sternotomy and thymectomy or should we do VATS uh, thymectomy for myasthenia gravis. Uh, the people who talk a lot about open sternotomy, repeatedly try to throw things like there is better clearance of all fat with an open sternotomy. You can get into all nooks and crannies of the chest to be able to take out uh, this uh, thymus and the ectopic thymic tissue. They talk about better completion, uh, complete remission rate for the patient. Uh, there is some mention by the open thymectomy group, and there is uh, some papers which say there are less complications with open sternotomy. And more importantly, they say that there is more recurrence rate when you operate on thymoma. That means there is more seeding of the thymoma because you're opening the two pleuras by vats. And that is something I think a bit uh, too much. And so I'm going to try and rebut all these things. Uh, I personally believe that this is the story. This is the real story, OK? Uh, vats and robotics is the real thing. And I think open sternotomy is, is, is a myth is in my field. Can you really compare this incision, this cut, uh, you know, cutting through bones, putting through wires to something like this? Is there really a comparison for the outcomes for the patient? I mean, it's quite clear that we are talking about A versus B, okay? It's, it's really a different world when you get into the VATS and the robotic domain. So let's look at what, what is happening and how we do these things. I mean, we know that with VATS, there's huge benefits, huge benefits in terms of size of incisions, hospital stays are shorter, earlier return to work, major complications. I don't even have to throw up the papers. There are enough papers out there. You know, the pain is less, as we've said. Inflammatory response, Bill Walker's uh, group from Edinburgh has shown clearly that there is reduced inflammatory response. Uh, my group now, I have had a guy do a thesis on immunological responses of robotics and VATS versus open surgery. And we've clearly shown that there's a substantial reduction in the immune response for these. So VATS offers a lot of benefits for the patients. In addition to that, if you throw in the robotic platform, 
for God's sake, the view is so good. Surgery is good because the view is good. That's the reality. If you get a better view, if you get a true three-dimensional view and a true depth of perception, then obviously the accuracy of your surgery improves. The other advantage is the dexterity of the surgical instruments. You know, you can move the robotic any which way. You can, it's like a car mechanic operating from below. You can go below the structure, look up and start operating from below up and have the same degree of freedom. So it really adds value to the surgery. And for me, the most important thing with VATS as opposed to robotics is that I do not have to depend on my assistant. My assistant just sits there. He takes a huge salary from me and just sits there. His job is to only open the chest if things go wrong. That's his job. That's the bottom line. That's why he's there. He's a qualified surgeon, but he's in theater because if something goes wrong and I don't have time to get in there, he at least will be there to put in the swab and open the chest. That's, that's the reason why he's there because I don't need an assistant in doing a robotic surgery. Definitely no assistant required. And most important for me for robotics is it is so easy to teach. I am 10 times more comfortable letting my first year resident do a robotic thymectomy than I am letting him do a VATS thymectomy. Because on a dual console, I have got the controls with me. And I can give him the controls whenever he's doing the operation. And if I feel he is not safe, I can take back all the controls. So it's like a driving car. When you learn a driving car, if you've got an instructor with clutch and brakes next to him, you're much, much more comfortable. So robotic really adds value in terms of teaching. It makes it very, very easy to teach a person to do surgery and thereby the learning curve drops quite dramatically. The other big advantage for me with robotic surgery is that I become ambidextrous. I've got diathermy in both hands and if I'm dissecting around the iota, for God's sake, I will not be comfortable by VATS pushing a diathermy around the iota with my left hand. But with robotics, the accuracy is so high and the control is so high that I very happily do a whole surgery with my left hand. And I've published a paper on that. You know, a right-handed surgeon doing a left-handed surgery because the anatomy was such that I couldn't use my right hand. It was a big tumor, my right hand got blocked, so I did the whole surgery with my left hand. And it really matters when you're doing complex surgeries like that. And then the other advantages of tremor filtering and stuff like that. For me, an ideal patient for whom I'll offer a VATS or now a robotic thymectomy is a young patient with no previous long-term steroid therapy, early onset of disease, and acetylcholine stress receptopolity. This is my standard indication for a patient who will undergo a robotic or a VATS thymectomy. Nowadays, VATS thymectomy, hardly ever I would do it. Only if a patient cannot afford the extra cost of the robot is when I go for VATS thymectomy. I have, don't have a problem with that, but most of the times, because of the ergonomics is so much better, I would prefer to go down the robotic route. Uh, whether you should go right side or left side, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of debate on this. Uh, some people are huge proponents of the left-sided approach. Jens Ruckert comes from the left side. Uh, Arvind Kumar comes from the left side. I go from the right side. I'm very comfortable with the right side because there's more space in there. So you can nicely dock, open the pleura, and m manipulate. On the left side, the heart comes in the way. But sometimes, some tumors are placed on the left, and you've got to go on the left, and I'm, I'm okay with that. But personally, I prefer to go on the right side. I do it right side. But nowadays, that has changed. In fact, nowadays, I go sub -zipoid. For thymectomies, almost most of my thymectomies, I go sub -zipoid. I make an incision there and dock my robot from the sub approach. That gives me the advantage to get into the right side and the left side. Whichever side I want to, I can see very easily in the clinic on both sides. I always use CO2 insufflation. That's one huge advantage of the robotic platform because it's a closed platform as opposed to VATS, which is an open platform because you make an incision and it's open to air. So the CO2, A, keeps the camera clear, nicely warmed up, and B, it dissects ahead of you. So as you dissect, the CO2 dissects ahead of you. So it drops the whole thing down pretty nicely. I personally open both the pleura and I am very radical about my dissections. I go phrenic to phrenic, right up into the neck, right down into the diaphragm at the angles of the diaphragm. This is my standard position for a robotic thymectomy. If you've got a sandbag, then you can push the hand down a little bit, but I personally just put it to the side. Always make sure don't go more than 90 degrees because you'll get axillary uh, brachial plexus uh, injuries. And I've had one case when I was doing my series early. 
I just dock in my ports and my robot docks in. Now, I'm going to show you this video. This is my year one training doing a robotic time estimate. So, you know, what I want to show you is I am just there on the console, on the other console. He is sitting on his console, and I'm guiding him to go through the robotic surgery. And, and what I want you to observe is how nicely and slowly he's dissecting. In fact, while you're doing the surgery, it's better to slow down. You will make up a lot of time because you don't have to close in wounds and things like that. So you take your time, nicely dissect, get into the neck, go right up there, find out the you know branches. Sometimes you get these branches from the chest wall coming down, find the uh, thymic uh, vein, nicely dissect it off. And this is actually my year one resident doing a surgery. That's the point I want to make, that I am very happily watching him do it. He's doing a nice and clean dissection, no worries about bleeding at the moment, he's beautifully handling the uh, brachiocephalic vein and pulling it all down. And where is the issue of view? The open people say you can't see well with VATS and robotics as you can see with an open surgery. Actually, that is completely wrong. You get better view with VATS and robotics because with a robot, you can go all the way in onto the left side, lean down and look at the whole phrenic very nicely. You turn around, you can then look at the diaphragm and you can nicely peel off all the fat. And usually what I do is once he's done the stuff, I will then take over from him and I'll look for all the residual fat. I look into the aortopulmonary window and I'll take out whatever else he's left behind. You get an excellent view in the aortopulmonary window for thymectomies. I mean, that's a myth if people say that, that's, uh, that open is better than that. All my patients are extubated on table. That is mandatory. I, I, am, I stay in theater till they are extubated. My asthenics, I keep them overnight in the ICU. That's purely to make sure that there are no respiratory compromise. I do not use any epidural catheters. Never, never. In all my surgeries, no epidural catheters. Single drain left in the chest, and next morning on the ward round, the drain comes out. I'm not so fussed about the volume of drainage. All these things, you know, less than 100 and all, is, is all rubbish. The, Denmark group has clearly shown that you can take out the drain even up to 500, 600 ml, no problems. We've had no re-interventions in our group. When it comes to thymoma, I'm a little more conservative. I will actually do thymomas which are smaller in size. Traditionally, ITMIC recommended that anything less than five centimeters you do by VATS or robotics, anything more than five centimeters, try to do it by open. But what happens is when you get more and more comfortable, you actually start docking patients in every patient, and you try and dissect as much as possible in a bigger thymoma I'm talking about. And then when you feel that you're not in a safe zone, you do the stenotomy and carry on. But the dissection becomes very good. Something like this, I wouldn't be stupid enough to dock the robot. That's, that's really crazy. So there is a role for open th uh, stenotomy. But to say that it is the only way to do surgery in this era, is actually completely wrong. In this day and age of you know, minimally invasive surgery, why would you put a 25-year-old young female through a sternotomy? For me, that is a criminal negligence, in my, in my view. Now, the issue of dissemination of a thymoma is very important. I personally am not a proponent of thymomectomy. I am a proponent of doing a thymectomy in the presence of a thymoma for the simple reason that when I do a thymectomy, I do what is called as a no-touch technique. I hold the fat, I grasp it, I pull it, I push it. I will never, ever, ever hold the thymoma. And once you realize that, then you do not get this problem of, you know, rupture of the capsule and seeding of the thymoma in the pleural space. We've all done these mistakes when early in our career, early in our learning, uh, learning curve, but now, I do not do thymomectomy. I really believe that you've got the fat, you've got the thymus, you've got the expertise. Why not just take it all around and deliver it out? And why leave any tissue behind? So in my uh, series of thymectomies, this is what we get. Two days stay. They come in in the morning. They are prepped up, have surgery that afternoon. Next morning, the drain is out. In fact, the same day, the, th the yoga therapist comes in, gets them up and about. And uh, next day, the drain is out and they're discharged. They're actually discharged in two days. All the numbers come around two. 
That's the bottom line. You, once you, your whole team gets set up and the pre and the post-op ERAS is taken care of, everybody gets discharged second day. Only reason why they'll stay back in a hospital is if I'm worried about a myasthenic crisis. Or if I feel that the myasthenia is uncontrolled, I will keep them into a hospital for another day. That's the only indication. Otherwise, surgically, there is no indication. So there's a lot of data out there, a lot of people looking at various things. Now, this, this meta-analysis looked at 12 studies, and they found no difference in the OT time and ICU time of VAX versus open. They found that the bleeding was less with VAX. Obviously, the hospital stay was less, and complication rate was less. And the incidence of myasthenia crisis was less with VAX. The other thing is there was no difference in the follow-up complete remission rate of the patient, open versus VAX. And so if that is the case, why would I do a sternotomy? You know, if I am getting a good complete remission rate equivalent to open surgery, there is no indication to do open surgery, in my opinion. Uh, this other study, again, found all equivalents everywhere. Even at six years follow-up, they found the same complete remission rate, VAX versus open. In fact, nowadays, we are not even looking at VAX versus open. We are looking more at VAX versus robotics. And Jens Ruckert has the largest series, actually, 300-plus cases of robotic thymectomy and another two, two, 250 with VAX thymectomy because he started with VAX. And he looked at his group... Uh, Com comparing the two, this is an earlier publication which he's had. Since then, I have actually spoken to him, and the results are the same. Because what matters is what is the remission rate. What is, are these patients benefiting with your surgery? It's not about cosmesis, it's not about incisions, it's not, it's not about looks. It's about are these patients benefiting from your surgery? And he conclusively showed that in his robotic group, he has found that the remission rate is better, much better than in his group of VAX. And, and Jens Ruckert is a very good surgeon. I have personally operated with him. He's a very meticulous surgeon. He doesn't leave anything behind. So there's a lot of data which is say, showing that robotics now is better than VAX. In fact, with thymomas now, this is the first time I've seen some guidelines which are actually showing that VAX is actually recommended for stage one and stage two. Early small thymomas, VAX is a better surgery than open surgery. So try and look at VAX as a complementary surgery. And Alan showed this paper, and he showed that VAX and robotics is cheaper than open surgery. Bernie Parks has done extensive work on this. And in fact, after this, subsequently, he's published with uh, Veronese, uh, Veronese from Italy. They did a multi-center study and looked at costs and things like that. And they have shown that VATS and robotics is cheaper than open surgery. That is the bottom line, because open surgery patients stay in hospital longer. The moment they stay in hospital longer, the cost goes up dramatically. But VATS is, of course, more expensive than robot. Uh, sorry, robotic is more expensive than VATS. We know that because the disposable cost is more. But in my personal, uh, in my personal opinion, I'm so comfortable with robot. I also look at my my uh, relaxation state, and you know, I see no reason to go by VATS until and unless the patient in insists that he wants it by VATS. So for me, the evidence is clear. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Professor Khan. So, uh, do you have any questions or comments? So, uh, the evidence is clear, so there will be no questions. <laughs> but but may, may I have one question? Yes. Uh, so, uh, uh, when you do uh, robotic uh, VAT surgery for the thymoma, uh, so do you uh, perform uh, lymph node dissection or lymph node sampling? I personally do lymph node dissection. I personally, because that's my... Uh, Questions? Okay. <laughs> Sorry for being late. I, I only ask this because you, you mentioned it very briefly without going into detail. You mentioned subxiphoid. I remember talking to you and you were mentioning air docking and doing yeah. a subxiphoid. Can yeah. you just elaborate on that? A okay. Bit? So in subxiphoid, now what I've started doing in the last. Uh, 10 or 12 cases is uh, we've started air docking the robot. I don't have, in, in the center where I do it, uh, I, I don't have the single port. So what I do is I make an incision in the, in the sub xiphoid area. I put in a camera. When I first started doing sub xiphoid, what I was doing was I was putting single incision, camera was coming sub xiphoid. One port was on the right side and one port was on the left side, left pleura. And that's how I was doing the whole thymectomy. 
But since then, what we've started doing is incision in the subsurface area, open it up widely, and then camera goes in, and the robotic ports stay outside. So that's called as air docking. So the robotic ports stay outside, but the instrument goes in through the incision. So that, that's a technique. We actually worked with Robert Serfolio when we were trying to do a cervical rip through a uh, axillary axis. And that's the first time we saw, we thought about subxiphoid. And then we saw the ENT people doing uh, base tongue surgery where they, they can't put everything in the thing. So they air dock the robot. So the robot stays outside, but the instruments go inside. And that's what we have done. In the last 12 cases, we've done that. We leave it up hanging outside. But that's because we don't have a single port. If we had a SP robot, then I think we would just get in there and do it. Okay, it's it's more fiddly though. It takes more, uh, you know, it, it's more takes more effort. But it, as you said, we are always trying to push the boundaries. So we've done it in our 12 cases. I still feel it's more fiddly. I think single port is the right way to do it. But at any point, if I find that it's becoming too much of a struggle or the heart is beating into my face, then I'll just put in a port on the side and move from an air dock to a side dock. Had to do it in two cases, but 10 we managed to finish with a subsurfer air dock. Thank you. So, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so I'd like to talk on uh, uh, surgical uh, therapy for uh, stage three and non-small cell lung cancer first. But so, uh, Dr. Samra is not here, so I changed a bit. Uh, so, uh, I'd like to talk on a stage three and non-small lung cancer uh, induction or surgery. So, uh, the principle of therapeutic strategy of non-small cell lung cancer is that surgical resection for complete cure if the patients have stage one to two lung cancer. If the patients suffer from uh, advanced lung cancer of stage 3B, 3C, or 4, non-surgical therapy, uh, such as uh, chemotherapy or immuno checkpoint inhibitor or uh, the molecular targeting drugs are used. But the stage 3A lung cancer is located just between the surgical therapy and non-surgical therapy. So uh, the stage 3A lung cancer includes various heterogeneous subsets. Uh, so uh, patients with uh, mediastinal lymph node involvement, uh, one sub subgroup includes patients with T3N1 or T4N0 to N1, uh, it means a locally advanced cancer. Uh, the other subgroups includes uh, 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 satellite nodules in the ipsilateral other lobes. Uh, so, uh, uh, so we uh, should uh, so, uh, think about the strategy of surgeries in each subset. So uh, first, uh, I'd like to talk on uh, stage 3A, N2 nodes positive, uh, mediastinal nodes positive. Uh, mediastinal lymph nodes, N2 nodes positive patients are the majority of stage 3A, uh, but we should be careful that N2 positive nodes are divided into very heterogeneous subgroups. So in this figure, uh, uh, subset 3A1 involves patients clinically diagnosed as N0 or N1. Uh, but uh, uh, N2 uh, metastasis uh, recognized intraoperatively uh, or after the uh, pathological study. So of course, uh, they are candidates for the uh, surgical therapy, of course. Uh, so upfront surgery uh, is chosen. So and uh, postoperative adjuvant chemotherapy will improve survival prognosis. So you know that uh, this is a very uh, so famous study, uh, prospective randomized study for patients diagnosed as stage 1B to 3A non-small cell lung cancer undergoing surgical rejection to evaluate the effectiveness of post-operative adjuvant chemotherapy with cisplatin plus vinolelvin. Uh, so uh, uh, elucidate that the pathological N2 patients have more favorable survival prognosis uh, uh, here. Uh, uh, so uh, with adjuvant chemotherapy than without chemotherapy. But uh, however, uh, so uh, in the subset of 3A3 and 3A4 subsets, 
uh, that includes the uh, uh, bulky lymph nodes, uh, 3A3, or the invasive uh, nodes uh, that cannot be surgically rejected. So is surgical therapy appropriate for these patients with critical N2? So uh, the, uh, there are some prospective randomized studies to evaluate the effectiveness of surgical therapy with induction chemotherapy compared with the definitive chemoradiotherapy. In this study, uh, progression-free survival uh, or overall survival uh, rates are not significantly different between the two groups. Uh, this is the most famous study, uh, INT0139 uh, study. Uh, so, but uh, however, the subgroup analysis showed that uh, uh, patients with clinical N2 were significantly benefited by lobectomy uh, after uh, induction chemoradiotherapy. So, uh, uh, but so uh, after the following uh, this newer study, however, shows that there was no significant difference of survival rate between patients undergoing both uh, chemoradiotherapy and surgery and those undergoing only chemoradiotherapy. And recently, uh, so, so Alan also showed this figure, so uh, recently prognosis of non-surgical therapy with chemoradiotherapy followed by immunocheck inhibitor uh, Malman, uh, has become better, the role of surgery after induction therapy may be changing. So thus, uh, NCCN guideline on stage 3A N2 positive non-small cell lung cancer uh, equal recommendation for definitive concurrent chemoradiotherapy and induction chemoradiotherapy plus uh, surgery uh, was described to date. And uh, there are many studies on surgical therapy of patients with N2 node positive non-small cell lung cancer. Number of positive N2 nodes significantly affects post-operative prognosis. Uh, in this study, uh, using IASLC database, post-operative overall survival rate of patients with single N2 node positive lung cancer are higher than that of patients with multiple N1 positive nodes. So maybe so a single N2 positive patients uh, the candidates for the surgical uh, rejection. So the, thus, the in NCCN guidelines, uh, they recommended that uh, patients with a single lymph nodes less than three centimeter can be considered for the multi-modality uh, approach that includes surgical rejection. And uh, patients uh, with negative mediastinum after new adjuvant therapy also have a better prognosis. So uh, it may be a, a good candidate for surgery. But so uh, uh, the, it is the principle of surgical therapy that the thoracic surgeons should actively uh, participate in multidisciplinary uh, discussions and meetings regarding lung cancer patients. Uh, this is, uh, so we should have the multidisciplinary tumor board. So in fact, so in our hospital, uh, we have a, a lung cancer board uh, in my hospital. So it is held uh, every week. And so, uh, uh, so uh, we and the, the Department of Respiratory Medicine, Radiology, Pathology, Gerontology, and Palliative Care uh, staffs uh, participate uh, this meeting. And then we moved on to another stage three a subset, uh, locally advanced lung cancer, T4N0 to T4N1. So the uh, definition of T4 is uh, the diameter of main tumor larger than seven centimeter or existence of separate satellite nodules in a different ipsilateral lobe. So, uh, uh, in clinical, uh, so uh, in clinical, uh, they uh, can be uh, rejected, uh, no, pro no problem. But the uh, uh, main tumor, uh, if the main tumor is directly invading to diaphragm, mediastinum, heart, great vessels, including aorta or vena cava, trachea, uh, recurrent laryngeal nerve, esophagus, vertebral body, or carina is also uh, classified uh, as T4. So uh, uh, the mainstay of treatment for non-small cell lung cancer is still radical surgical rejection. So the upfront surgery is recommended if the tumor is completely rejectable, even the tumor is classified as T4. So these figures show a case of patient uh, suffering from adenoid cystic carcinoma invading the carina directly and uh, tumor arose from the right main bronchus involving bifurcation at carina. No lymph node or distant metastasis was found. So uh, we decided to do a, a approach surgery. We performed the right upper sleeve pneumonectomy, uh, right pneumonectomy with concomitant rejection of carina and anastomosis between trachea and the left main bronchus. Uh, sleeve pneumonectomy is uh, indicated for very selected patients with uh, uh, 
uh, advanced cancer involving carina. Uh, but so uh, in Japan, uh, around uh, 42,000 uh, patients underwent lung cancer surgery in one year. Uh, of them, only 15 patients had undergone sleep pneumonectomy. So uh, this uh, surgery is indicated for the very selected patients. And uh, I showed the NCCN guideline of superior sulcus tumor. Uh, in this chart, if the tumor is possibly rejectable, uh, preoperative concurrent chemoradiotherapy was recommended. So uh, uh, preoperative uh, adjuvant chemoradiotherapy plays the role of tumor size reduction, uh, which facilitates the uh, radical rejection. So uh, I showed the another case. Uh, the figures will show a uh, case of non-small cell lung cancer arising from the right upper lobe uh, directly invading the vena cava superior. So I see the... Oh, sorry. So the, the tumor is uh, invading the uh, superior vena cava and the right uh, innominate vein was occluded by the tumor. So, uh, we, uh, so after the, uh, the lung cancer mode, uh, we decided to do uh, uh, induction chemoradiotherapy uh, for the patient. Uh, after chemoradiotherapy, the size of the tumor is uh, very diminished, and, uh, uh, but uh, uh, still the tumor is invading directly into the SVC, so we decided to do a right upper lobectomy with concomitant rejection of the SVC and reconstruction of the SVC. So uh, we performed a right upper lobectomy with the concomitant rejection of superior vena cava. Uh, we reconstructed the vein with Guatex vascular prosthesis uh, from the left innominate vein to the right auricle first. Then uh, we uh, started the SVC rejection and the right upper lobectomy. The tumor is, uh, of course, uh, uh, very uh, adhered to the uh, uh, innominate artery, uh, but it couldn't, could be uh, dissected from the uh, uh, tumor. And uh, so, uh, but uh, uh, actually, the number of the patients undergoing SVC reconstruction is only uh, 29 among three, uh, 30,000 patients undergoing lobectomy for lung cancer in Japan in 2016. So it is also uh, the surg uh, surgical procedure is uh, 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 for the highly selected patients invading the SVC. Usually, uh, these patients will undergo the chemoradiotherapy. And so uh, I'll show the third case. Uh, this figure uh, shows a case of patients with pulmonary intimal sarcoma, uh, not uh, no small cell lung cancer, but uh, the, it is arising from the left lung, uh, directly invading the main PA, uh, proximal to the bifurcation. And uh, so uh, uh, we found no uh, distant metastasis or lymph node uh, metastasis of the patients, so uh, we could do a, uh, we thought that we could do a, a complete rejection for the patients uh, with a, a cardiopulmonary bypass. And so uh, we decided to, the tumor can be rejected with a pneumonectomy and the reconstruction of main pulmonary artery under cardiopulmonary bypass. We plan to surgical procedures for radical rejection, uh, blood access uh, for the uh, cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, left thoracotomy, intraoperative vascular ultrasonography to confirm the area of invasion, so, and under cardiopulmonary bypass, uh, patch plasty reconstruction of main PA is uh, completed, then left pneumonectomy uh, can be done, uh, we thought. And uh, this is a video. So a uh, left thoracotomy was done and a uh, uh, pedicle of intercostal muscle was uh, made for the uh, coverage of the bronchial stump. And then uh, we opened the pericardium and uh, we encircled the main PA here. And uh, so this is the intraoperative echocardiography. The tumor can be seen, uh, oh, oh, sorry. We encircled the main PA and echocardiography, 
uh, was performed, and we saw the uh, tumor uh, intruding into the main PA. But so uh, we found that the uh, no, not so uh, wide area was invaded. So uh, uh, we incised the main PA and the cardiovascular cardio bypass, and so you can see the, the tip of the tumor uh, in the main PA, and it was uh, dissected. And uh, the part of the wall of the uh, main PA was also rejected. So uh, we used a vent tube to clear the uh, blood uh, in the surgical field. And the tumor was uh, completely uh, rejected from the tip of the tumor was completely rejected from the uh, main, uh, main PA. And uh, uh, first, uh, we performed the uh, plasty of main PA uh, under ca cardiopulmonary bypass. And uh, after the uh, main PA plasty was uh, finished, uh, we uh, uh, stopped the cardiopulmonary bypass and do a, a left pneumonectomy uh, in a standard uh, manner. Uh, the vent tube is now uh, drawn up. And the uh, uh, plastic main piece is now drawn. Yeah, uh, in this case, uh, so lung transplantation case, uh, so if we need a cardio, cardio pulmonary bypass, so cardiovascular surgeons in our hospital uh, always help us. So, <laughs> so they are very cooperative. Then the uh, pneumonectomy is done by the stapling of uh, uh, left upper uh, vein, uh, left lower vein, and uh, finally the bronchus was uh, stapled by uh, the, what's it here? Okay, so uh, I stop. Uh, this is the uh, rejected specimen. Uh, you can see the, the tip of the tumor uh, from the uh, lumen of the main PA. And so, uh, 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 radical rejection of T4 lung cancer is a very invasive surgery. Uh, in Japan, hospital mortality of each surgery ranged from 0 to 33% three, of hospital mortality uh, in, in each case. And uh, five-year postoperative survival was fair if radical rejection can be done. So in summary, uh, stage 3A lung cancer involves heterogeneous uh, subsets of patients. For patients with clinical N2, mediastinal positive nodes, uh, indication for surgery is still controversial. Uh, for patients with clinical T4N0 or T4N1, uh, locally advanced lung cancer, upfront surgery is indicated for highly selected patients. Induction chemotherapy is considered if complete rejection will be difficult, but not absolutely impossible. Otherwise, uh, chemoradiotherapy may be the second choice for radical treatment. Uh, thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I, I, uh, uh, any comments? Uh, uh, just like a fantastic talk, uh, that was very comprehensive. But I'd just like to ask your personal opinion on uh, uh, the N2 positive nodes. Because NCCN, as you showed, they already listed Devalumab as a definitive uh, uh, treatment. But I, in your view, is, is the evidence really that sufficient? I, I think the Pacific trial actually uh, does have flaws in it, and it, it tends to undervalue the, the, the uh, role of surgery. In, this, in a lot of these trials, they actually uh, arbitrarily define unresectable or resectable uh, Lung cancer, and I, I, I'm just curious what your own personal take on that is. Devalumab really the final.
final solution, or is there still a continued role for, for us? Uh, yes, yes, so of course, so I, I'm a surgeon, so I'd like to do a surgery. So uh, the, uh, the, if the, uh, the media stand lip nodes is uh, uh, so absolutely positive, uh, so uh, such as the very large lip nodes or the bulky lip nodes, so uh, the, 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 uh, the uh, physicians of internal medicine uh, so <laughs> uh, so uh, so uh, suggested that uh, the, the it should be done by chemo radiotherapy, not surgery. But so so there are many cases. So here, so the the patients has a uh, uh, pulmonary fibrosis uh, or other uh, the conditions uh, that can be good for the chemo radiotherapy. The surgery is uh, chosen first. And so, uh, the, if the uh, lymph node is uh, so intermediate, so the not so large but so small people, so we'd like to cho uh, choose the uh, surgery, of course. Uh, and and uh, of course, the, uh, if the uh, node is positive for the cancer, so we'd like to do uh, uh, adjuvant chemotherapy afterwards. Jim, excellent uh, presentation. I, I really love your surgical video. Uh, I, I personally uh, do crinal resection for tubercular structures and things like that. And we've had to go on bypass a couple of times to get into that area. But, uh, you know, I have been presented cases like this where they say, anyway, this guy is going to die. Why don't you give him a chance? My worry is that you go on bypass. Uh, are you not worried about systemic metastases of this uh, tumor? Uh, while he has gone on bypass and things like that? Uh, what happened uh, to this patient eventually? Uh, yes, so the, the, uh, for, for the, the, uh, so the sleep pneumotomy patients, so uh, uh, I operated him uh, three years ago and he's still alive without cancer. Really? Uh, he, wow. He's doing well. So, so we, we, we can actually happily go ahead and go on bypass and do these uh, complex resections, is it? They don't cause systemic metastasis? What uh, is the evidence from Japan? You guys are uh, so the most of Yeah, them. so the, there are some uh, opinions that the, 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 uh, the resection of the uh, satellite uh, metast uh, small metastasis uh, outside the chest uh, is effective for the patients with lung cancer. Uh, but uh, so clinically, I, I don't have a, so a definite case. Uh, so uh, uh, after following up, uh, if the uh, patient has, uh, uh, for example, the metastasis in the uh, adrenal, or uh, bone or uh, lung, so uh, we'd like to reject uh, by chance. Given the fact that this guy's still alive three years down the road, I think hats off to you. And, and it gives us encouragement to do cases like these rather than just re re rejecting them as uh, inoperable. So yeah. thank you very much for that. Thank you. So as this is a maximally invasive surgery, so we, I, I, we got, I saw a lot of report from mainland China. They do a lot extensive resection on all sorts. Um, just uh, sort of digressing that Juma with the bypass machine, we do it routinely in the renal Jumas invading the IVC. That is a re established treatment that we got to, it does all the time. We never find any metastasis anywhere. Actually, my question is a simple two technical ones. Um, how do you find the dissection after the chemo radiation? You know, how difficult it is? Is there any tricks to it? Uh, another one is uh, how do you replace the SVC because we use three or four different material and none of them works with us. Mm. Yeah, so first, uh, so the, so the recently the, the, the patients after chemo radiotherapy, so, uh, so usually, so uh, uh, in the, uh, the previous time, so I uh, felt very hard to dissect uh, the, the tumor from the uh, neighboring organs. Maybe uh, because of the radiation, uh, the uh, uh, radiation uh, is, uh, uh, not good uh, so at that time, but uh, recently the uh, the technique of radiation is very improved, and so I don't uh, feel so any not so many difficulties uh, even uh, before the uh, the chemo radiotherapy or after chemo radiotherapy. I don't I don't feel no difference, and so uh, the second question is. Uh, Uh, so uh, this time I used uh, Goatex uh, uh, prosthesis, uh, the ring the graft. So, uh, so I, I I usually use yes. So so it, 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 so I I think that uh, the Goatex uh, ring the Goatex is very good uh, because uh, uh, it is uh, 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 so uh, so uh, the. Uh, 
uh, excuse me. Uh, 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 so I, I, I use, but uh, so I, I, uh, I feel that uh, uh, so uh, uh, it is uh, uh, resistant to uh, coagulation. So I, I oh, of course, uh, routinely I use uh, warfarin uh, for uh, three or six months uh, after the surgery. Uh, but uh, so I met so a uh, uh, few uh, experience of uh, so obstruction uh, because of a clot. Any other questions? So thank you very much. So this uh, session is closed now. <laughs> <laughs>